So it looks like that you had a career in, and you know studying finance, accounting, had a career in banking and finance. But then there was some point in time that you decided to you know switch your career, and and mm -hmm. and I think that in life there's a lot of people have that you know moment in life that would change but not a lot of people had that privilege of really changing and and had the career fulfillment so uh, you yeah. are doing something that you really love to do and we want to ex you know to to do that after C to see you know what happened and then so we walk you through you, your little you know when you were a kid and then when you grow up what did you study what happened when you go to career ladders you've successful but you decided to take a leap of faith and do something different so yeah I've, I've taken that leap a few times probably not near as much i would have arrived faster at what i'm doing now if i had a, a moved a little quicker so if there's anything i can offer uh those that listen today is to if it doesn't feel right don't go there just keep going in the direction of what feels good to your soul um but yeah i um i was my parents passed away when I was little, very young, and I, I um, went to live with my grandmother and um, an alcoholic grandfather, which we eventually went out on our own to live with my great-grandmother and my grandmother. Wow. So it was a very um, poor situation, and I think wow. that upbringing is really what uh, set me off on the financial degree that I got because I swore to myself I would never be poor again mm -hmm. and I think you know anyone that comes from a background of struggle may uh, think that that's the choice to make to go for the money and I would say uh, that's not the choice you need to make that um, but anyway that's what started me on the degree to get to get a finance degree and to go to college no one in my family had been to college at the time mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I, I swore never to be poor again. And so I got the degree in finance and, and started in the banking realm and I uh, had a lot of success initially in management, kind of climbing the ladder in an organization that uh, through multiple mergers, actually it was the merger mania of the 90s, uh, ended up being the largest bank in America, Bank of America. And um, from there, I had my daughter. So that kind of changed things. Um, man, I had already felt that management was not necessarily um, where I needed to be. And I certainly took away from the raising of my daughter. So that's when I shifted to financial advising, gave me a little more freedom mm. uh, and independence as, you know, I was only responsible for myself and taking care of my clients. And that allowed me a lot of freedom to, because I worked for an independent at the time. Mm. Um, well, I started with Bank of America, but then shifted to an independent firm owned by Wells Fargo. Mm. And that allowed me all the freedom I needed to raise my daughter and, and do what I wanted to do as a mom and as a wife. Um, but even as <clears throat> that filled the, the need, I guess, from a f family point of view, uh, there was still a discontent in my spirit as to that was not fulfilling me professionally the way that I wanted it to. And um, so, I was about to make the leap of faith again. You know, I'd made the leap of faith from management to advising, and I was about to make the leap of faith again um, to become a coach and, and an author. Uh, and the 2008 financial crash happened. Mm. And um, so I ended up staying around a couple of years longer than I needed to. In Southwest Florida, we're very much a seniors market. So I felt like leaving my clients at that point was, was not the right uh, thing to do because they were scared. They had lost half of their wealth. And I really wanted to hold their hands through uh, the return of the market at that point. But in 2010, I, I left um, 
left that position and that career and didn't look back and uh, felt that I needed to uh, focus on a, a higher purpose mm. and began to serve mostly volunteer and um, teach principles of faith and leadership and even went to on to create a uh, women women's leadership model for the faith community and uh, launched a nonprofit. Mm. But even after a number of years there, I still did not have that fulfillment, even though we were doing great work and I felt that the purpose was certainly um, meaningful. It, it was it was meaningful externally, but it wasn't um, creating the meaning internally that I knew was missing. And so in that volunteer time, which was um, about six years, I had gotten a couple different coaching certifications mm. and obviously we're coaching women and, and helping develop them as leaders. Um, I decided at the, when I ran into that wall of unfulfillment again, that I would kind of look at my own life through those coaching lenses that I had learned. And so I, I dove into Simon Sinek, start with the why mm. um, coaching program, which I had gotten a certi certification in. And so as I uh, looked at how he walks you through the, the what and the how and the why parts, um, I noticed this, this um, kind of underlying, I called it the track that my brain ran on. Mm. Um, and it, I had done it as a manager throughout all those promotions in leadership. I had done it even as a financial advisor with my clients. And when I'd entered the nonprofit world, I'd done it again. And so I said, okay, well, if these are, and there was about, there were five things and I had labeled them a little bit different, but I said, if these are the five things where I was at my best and doing my best work and feeling, you know, like I was doing meaningful work and f doing work that excited me and, and uh, drove me to, to do it, mm. that's what I wanted to build a consulting practice around. Mm. And having written a couple of books in the nonprofit area, the faith-based area, uh, I decided, okay, well, I know if, if these are the five things I need to do and I want to build a consulting practice around those five things, I need to learn how to write about those five things in a business context because they were really were um, most conducive in a business context. And uh, so as I began to research how to write about those five things, I just... And so that's when I decided um, in 2018, I guess it was, to go and get a degree in design thinking and innovation. Mm. Um, and that was kind of the coming home moment for me mm. when I was in that class and in that course um, because, uh, you know, it, it really resonated with who I am and, and how I see the world and how I operate in the world. And so, yeah, that's kind of what got me here to design thinking consultant. Um, of course, as soon as I was wrapping up my degree uh, in 2019, the world began to fall apart at the end of that year with COVID. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so uh, we're just continuing down that path to, you know, fulfilling what I feel is my purpose here on planet Earth. And that is designing um helping companies design the future of how they work. Mm -hmm. And because uh, throughout, my, you know, when you look at design thinking, it's been traditionally product design and mm -hmm. service design. It's evolving still and it's becoming business model design. And, and really I see it as a, uh, a, a, the future of leadership. It's not just a process you use to improve a product or improve a service, but it's, it's a, set of leadership principles in my viewpoint mm. that we can use to not just uh, maximize the potential of the organization, but maximize the potential of every individual mm. on your team or within the organization. So that's how I view it. Um, it's a fairly new concept or, or one that's just beginning to be talked about. I think the first article I've read 
on design thinking as a leadership principle was in 2015 in Harvard Business Review. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a fairly new concept, but one that I feel like I've, I've been doing my whole life, mm -hmm. um, just not realizing that it was design thinking that I was practicing. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing that. And Karen, sorry that uh, um, you had a rough childhood and 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 but we are so proud of you because through through that challenging time challenging time childhood and you took an oath on yourself you know never be poor again and you strive and then you try to be better 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 and get your life to better direction every day and uh, and the success that you had in the in the financial sector is phenomenal and then you took a leave of faith to go go into the and you know like the advisory right the financial advisory so that you can have more time more freedom, then you took a little faith again for the non-profit, and then you took a little faith again to start your own company. So every moment in there, that they're all, you know, we're going to bring you all the way, and you're back in the moment in there, okay? Now, yeah. it will start with your childhood, all right? Mm, okay. So, you know, I think that under, uh, under adversity, we are more creative. You know, we because mm. you know if you know if, your situation makes or break us, right? So you know, sometimes yeah. people we we you know we crash and then we live the life as is. But some amazing people, uh, you know, that we find a way to survive and to thrive. So when you were a little girl, you know, beside making that oath, uh, and what did you dream one day you would become, Karen? You know, my um. Childhood really was just one of survival. I, I thought about that often. What did I dream of? Um, I think I was so um, stuck at the time in, in the poverty and, and the lack that was my family situation that I don't know that I had a lot of time to dream. Um, you know, my earliest recollection of you know what do you want to be when you grow up it was an archaeologist mm. and I don't even know why that is because in the little South Georgia town that I grew up in you know perhaps there was a National Geographic show or something that I saw that made me think that but when I think about what I do now it it really is not necessarily about digging in the dirt for treasures but more about digging deeper within ourselves for the treasure that is within each of us mm -hmm. um, so and I think that's that's what I've done personally and hopefully what I help companies do is to dig deep within themselves for the treasures that are there um, because I, I do believe everything happens for a reason mm. and you're right when you come from a place of lack or from a place of nothing those constraints do allow you to tap into your creativity mm. um, they also are uh, you know I was just having this conversation with my husband this morning they also when we can look back on those places and realize what we've endured then normally the challenges that are ahead of us really are nothing compared to what we've already been through. Mm. Um, and everything that we've already been through has equipped us to go through what it is we're, uh, whatever challenge we're facing now. So, mm. you know, each time I took a leap of faith, you know, um, when I went from the vice president in leadership at the bank to investment advising, you know, I went from a nice salary to zero mm. and um, I can only do that because I knew what zero was mm. and I was much even though I may have been starting at zero again I was much further than the last time I was at zero mm. um, and the same thing with when I left the financial career obviously I had grown into making a, a good money I mean there's great money in financial advising and again, I was faced with I'm going to go to zero mm. to pursue what I feel is is uh, what I need to be pursuing. But again, I even though I was going back to zero financially, I was not going back to zero mm. in my experience and my knowledge and uh, the value that I felt I could bring to the next endeavor that I had. And even you know leaving the nonprofit and starting again in design thinking I wasn't going back to zero mm. um, because our value is never outside of us or any dollar figure that is 
slapped on our paycheck. Our value is within us. Mm. And when we are continually seeking to bring that value to the world, I, I don't think we have to worry about the dollar on the paycheck. It will take care of itself. And for those that might be in that situation and the fear of that is very real, um, you know, shift your focus from, just like you've done in, in this community, off of yourself and onto, well, not off of yourself in that you're irrelevant and your needs are irrelevant. Obviously, you, you have to eat and you have to have a place to sleep. But how can you take not the value of your bank account, but the value of is service to others. And I think when you are in service to others, mm. um, you will be taken care of. Um, <laughs> I you actually, know. Yep, I truly a believer of servicing others. And then there's a joy in servicing people too. And then when I was yeah. a Leo, I was actually was born in the family that uh, we don't really, you know, have a constraint about financial. But then I chose mm -hmm. to live in a life that I self constrain myself. So that you know, what if there's nothing tomorrow? So how do how would we live? And 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 from there, you know, it made me feel a lot more sympathy for the people around us. I'm connecting a lot more closer in a deeper level to my friends and, and the and the unknown people on you know on the street. So so it's easy to make us closer and realize the human side of uh, of a human beings. And in here, you mentioned a lot about the meaningful in the external side, but there's not a meaningful internal side. So when we yeah. find, when you know, I'm glad that you found the internal strength because that strength is a muscle that you build inside of you, within you, and then nobody can take that muscle away from you, right? <laughs> no, not at all. Yeah. But I'm curious also back then, you know, when, when you know, with the, uh, and then I put it in here is that in the environment of lack, Right, and then you, there could be any other majors you chose, and uh, to study. But then you chose to study, uh, you know, in in the in the finance banking sector and get into that for twenty plus years uh, in that you know space. So why did you choose? Why did you think that that industry is making a lot of money and then getting you out uh, away from you know being poor? Well, you, I, to me, you know, it's just the naivety of a of a. 16, 18 year old to think, okay, I, I want to make money in my life. So let's go where the money is. And mm. that's, that's how I made that decision. That shows how <laughs> naive I was in making that decision. Um, you know, when I was in college, I had already chosen the, deg the degree, obviously. Mm. Um, I, I did do a couple things right in following my heart. You know, when you're talking about money, there's the opportunity for accounting. And then you talk about uh, money there's the opportunity for finance those are two of the you know money driven i guess uh degrees in the business school um but i i hated accounting <laughs> I, it, I hated it i mean i know it's for some people but it was not for me um it, it's very black and white everything's you know a debit or a credit and in the financial world i was drawn to um the depth of learning that's available in the financial world. I mean, obviously, if you if you study finances, um, things are always changing. Um, there may be some financial principles that are the basis of the financial system, but you know, you're always following trends. You're looking for the underlying meaning in in, in what's going on in a corporation. So. To me, it, it suited my personality better than the accounting world, mm. um, which was very driven by, you know, black and white and regulations and uh, rules. <laughs> As an innovator, I'm not a rule follower. So I, I, even though it's funny, I had the best looking accounting teacher on the college campus, I couldn't take, I hated the topic. But... Uh, <laughs> The finance uh, was intriguing to me because it allowed you to use your intuitive abilities, which I think are, 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 are our creative abilities to follow trends and to look for 
uh, underlying themes. And, and so, yeah, that's why I was drawn to that side of things. And so by the time I was ready to graduate, um, we had, you know, everybody has that college course where you go and you interview people and the careers that you're thinking about. Mm. And I interviewed a banker, I interviewed a financial advisor, and I interviewed an insurance salesman. And strangely, you know, what took me out of financial advising was the market crash. What kept me from going there in the first place was the financial crash. I think it was uh, the collapse of 87. 80 something, yeah. Black Friday was. Uh -huh. um, so basically the the uh, advisor that I interviewed, yeah, he was distraught. It was a terrible time in the financial industry. He had watched friends commit suicide, like jump out of buildings because the market was so bad. And I did not want that. <laughs> there was nothing about that that was attractive based on my interview with that gentleman. Mm. And then the insurance field was all about sales, mm. sales, sales, sales. And I was a shy, introverted, uh, you know, very quiet person at that age. And I did not want to be out there selling anything. <laughs> and um, so I chose, that's why I chose banking at the time, because yeah. it was a safe, you know, be of service mentality at the time. And little did I know the banking world was about to be turned upside down and be all on sales and obviously that's what led to much much of the lawsuits mm. uh in their you know choice of making that but that's that's the <laughs> the naive mindset i had of making my career choice so i i i love the word naive in there and then which is uh that's you know when we were young there's a lot of we you know and back in that time there's not a lot of choices for us to you know to realize what the, you know to really know where the future is going to be, especially if you live in the environment where not a lot of people can give you advices. So you live with your best instinct. So your natural instinct is very, very powerful. And that's why I would like to, you know, get into that one a little bit and want to know the Karen after get out of university and get into the financial. I want to see, uh, and you know, um, the the motivation, the drives that make you, because your career grow is very phenomenal. There's a lot of people getting to the bank themselves too, right? But look at you know how many people get into the top ladder, you know, and then mm -hmm. and then what drives you back then? Would you have a day looked like to you back then? You know, um, at the time when I started, the bank was called. Um, well, the day I landed at the bank, they were already in their first merger, which should have been a sign for me because it was one merger after the other. But it was um, it was a Lee County Bank had been taken over by Citizens and Southern, but they had a wonderful um, manager training program. So I trained for a year and I went through every department of the bank. Mm. Obviously, it was a lot different than it is now because things were not as centralized as they are now. So, you know, I could go through operations. I could go through commercial lending, retail, you know, every area of the bank. So for a year, I was able to go and learn through, from every area of the bank that I was a part of. And at the end of the year, that's when I was able to become a manager, you know, and I was at the time I was the youngest uh, manager officer of the bank that they had ever hired. But I didn't know crap, you know, they were, I didn't know anything. Uh, I mean, I had learned a lot, yes, but I still knew nothing about managing people. Mm. Um, but I'm an avid learner and I always go deep in subjects. And so not only was I learning in every department that I went in, I was reading leadership book after leadership book after leadership book. Mm. And so even that when I went into my first leadership position, it, I was opening a brand new branch in the middle of nowhere because that was when banking was, you know, let's put a bank on every corner. Mm. Um, you know, so they gave me some good staff members, people that had been in banking a while, uh, had done their jobs a while. They, they tried their best to set me up for success, but I still knew I knew nothing. Mm -hmm. And I knew that my people knew that I knew nothing as far as a leader went. So 
that's when kind of my natural intuitive sense kind of put all that I had learned together. Uh And I knew that one of the greatest ways you build trust is to listen. And so I started that first office by what is now what I now know to be the empathy phase of design thinking. And I interviewed all of my employees. I think there were three or four at the time. Mm -hmm. And I learned from them. I said, you know, this is what they, this is our goal and our vision for this office. Uh, You know, we're out here in the middle of the nowhere, so I don't know how we're going to accomplish that, but tell me, you know, you've been around the banking world a while, you know, what works, what doesn't work, you know, how can we, try these things out here in this experiment and um you know that created tremendous buy-in and it also valued their experience it valued their gifts Mm. because as they were telling me what worked and what didn't work Mm. that they had seen from their experience i said you know well what do you think we should try and and you know, working towards these goals that we have and what, what excites you about that. Mm. So they were able to bring in their gifts. And, you know, I think to everyone's amazement, including my own, we, we ended up winning the the national trip that year Uh. and (laughs) surpassing our goals um, on every level. And so that kind of started for that particular journey, that decade, um, a promotion every two years and kind of ironically or I, I don't know ironically maybe that's not the right word um, not only did I get promoted every two years but I, there was also a new marriage every two years so every two years I was being thrown into a larger uh, location mm-hmm. I was responsible for bringing two teams together from the merged organizations and then obviously, you know, new goals and, and uh, visions for this new collective organization. Um, but I thrived in it. In mm-hmm. fact, I think part of the reason why I was able to do that every two years is because about 18 months in, mm-hmm. I was frustrated and bored and kicking and moaning and screaming. And my manager was like, oh, we got to give her something, a new <laughs> challenge. And so that's what would happen. Um, you know, I think the foresight or the, or the lack of sight on, on leadership back then was th- that um, they didn't see the gift that I could have offered to all the locations to mm-hmm. teach them how I did mm-hmm. what I did in those organizations, which was design thinking at the time. But um, yeah, it, I, I really thrive on challenge. I thrive mm-hmm. on uh, change. I thrive on, you know, what people thought was the impossible, bringing two teams from organizations that really weren't a lot alike together mm-hmm. and, and, and setting them up for success in the, in the new world that they were about to enter. And so those were fun times for me. Mm. I think that, I, you know, one of the things that I'm always fascinated to learn and to know is whether leaders are born or leaders are made. There's, you know, that is chicken and egg always, you know, talk about it. And then uh, some yeah. people, some people really la- like uh, a born leader, you know, like in, in the situation. Yeah, I know in here because you show vulnerability, uh, you know, to your team in the, in the year of 1990, something like that. And in mm-hmm. the industry that is very fiercely competition where people are in suit and if you look out and you don't you show that you don't know things, people will look down you but back then you took a leap of faith and show vulnerable as it invited people to come in and, and, and share an idea, contribute and then build you know success from showing vulnerability. It's very advanced leadership. Back then it's not even existing. Okay, so yeah, yeah, so so Karen, good job. <laughs> but um, so so and, you know that is that we admire you for sharing that story and and yeah. and then during the 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 time that you're very successful, that's nothing. That there's something inside of you is not happy, wasn't it? Yeah, mm. no. What um, doesn't make you happy? That make you take a leap of faith and move. Uh, you know, you out of the the bank and go into the financial uh, advisory sector? Um, well, 
there was the discontent that I kept running up up against every couple years in the banking center world. So, and I think that's just a part of my personality. Mm. You know, when you think about a creative and an innovator, um, creativity works in spurts. You have a creative inspiration, you follow it to its conclusion, and then you're ready for the next creative um, idea. Mm. That's what was happening to me as a, as a leader you know, I was, I was brought to the challenge. I had the creative inspiration and I was running through that, you know, when, and, and every personality is different. I think that's important to understand. But for me, you know, when I got to the point where I was, I was managing and it was the same thing day in and day out, I was bored. I was agitated. Mm -hmm. You know, I was not using the gifts that I was meant to use any longer. And so that's, you know, when my manager would say, what are we going to do with her? Let's give her a new location. But, but um, you know, some people are made to thrive in that day-to-day -day managing world. Mm. Um, I wasn't. And so I didn't know what I um, was meant to do at that point. I just knew that doing this over and over, over again was was not what I needed to do because even though the next branch was a challenge and I would run through the process again and then the next branch was a challenge it was always the same challenge over and over again mm. and I could have followed that up the ladder I suppose but um, something in me told me that that wasn't it mm. you know that you know doing the same thing on a larger scale um, wasn't necessarily what I needed. And so really at that point in my life, my daughter was, I think, three. And I just, I knew that, okay, I'm not going to figure out myself at this point. Um, I need to do something that that's going to, I guess, balance my life out mm. between work and profession. Because even though I was all engrossed in what I was doing as a manager, um, I still felt that I wasn't doing living up to my full potential in my in my own family as as a mother. So I said, okay, let's kind of take a step back, and we'll balance this out a little bit better. Mm. And uh, yeah, that that's kind of where I, what made me take the next step. It really wasn't any big career aspiration was it, it was more about okay how can I be more independent still make a great living but also be there mm. the way I want to be for my mother or for my daughter and my family mm. back then whose advice did you seek uh, before you make that leave of faith and move it to the next step um, hmm. I'm sure I sought some people's advice, but I guess um, I'm more of a researcher at heart, I guess. So uh, it was probably more research driven than necessarily talking to any particular person. I'm, I'm fairly independent in my thought, which my husband would probably complain about. <laughs> <laughs> that somehow could be a power of uh, that, of the um, introvert person, though. So you know, because yeah, an yeah. introvert, you have you know, you talk to yourself a lot more, and then you try to understand what inner self telling you, and then maybe the people outside would not be able be able to understand, and then you would not be able to share the whole picture too for the people to fully understand the situation. It's best to just to go with you know your intuitive, right? <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, there were a lot of people at that point in my life had no idea why I was doing what I was doing, mm. and quite frankly, I did it. Um, I just knew that it was a change I needed to make, mm. and uh, I couldn't fully communicate why I needed to make it either. Beyond you know being there for my daughter, which I think most people understood that. Mm. I, I think you know, um, and also in our in our life work in our in our life in general, we've seen a lot of people giving advice as on you know if somebody come to them and say hey I want to do something like this 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 and then 
And then without the deep understanding, you know, majority we say, hey, no, you're crazy and things like that. But then, you know, if you don't have enough data, you don't know, understand the, the how and the why and the what they want to do. And, you know, you, some, you know, even with great intention, but then you may be holding them back instead of, you know, give them wings to fly. So advice is sometimes good, but sometimes, you know, it's just better get advice from in the inside. Right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. That is uh, definitely true. Mm. Definitely true. Karen, I want to bring you forward into now. Let's keep the the time in the financial sector. Let's keep the time in the uh, the 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 uh, what is that? The NGO, right? No, the the um, when you work for the, the nonprofit, uh, nonprofit, yeah. yes. Uh, mm. You know, when you when you type into design thinking and and again it's a very new not new but then it's it's not old too it's, this this term is only a few years in the market right and then that then you realize that you you like it and then you develop a uh, your own company surrounding the ideas of design thinking how how you can help business leaders to change the culture to change the way that they do and by applying design thinking. How, how could you think of that idea at the beginning, though? Well, you know, I my goal is always to be as authentic as I can mm -hmm. be. Um, and I knew that coming out of the course that I took, the MBA that I got in design thinking and innovation, that I could not go out to the world and sell myself as a design thinker, that I can, you know, transform your product or your service um, because I didn't have experience in that. I really like to come from uh, an authentic place of my own experience and what I've accomplished and what I've done. And so I knew looking back, regardless of what career, even the financial advisor, I used design thinking, even though I didn't have a team, my team were the client's mm. team. It was the client, their trustees, their attorneys, their CPA. So the team was very diverse mm. that I used design thinking with. But anyway, I knew looking back on all three careers that, you know, I had used design thinking from a leadership perspective. And that was really the only means of which I had to talk about design thinking because I didn't have experience using design thinking in product or service design. You know, in the nonprofit realm, it was really about a business model that was not working any longer in the faith organization. So mm. I, I knew that my experience with design thinking had not matched up exactly with, you know, the historical perspective of design thinking, but I had to stick with what I knew and what I knew had been successful and done well for myself and that was from a leadership perspective and so I saw empathy and defying the problem and even ideation and all five steps of design thinking not as a process tool as per se but as a leadership principle mm. um, and so that's that's how I began talking about it. Mm. Because the term design thinking, we're understanding this region is about product design, service design, but then going to the, you know, like a very core of the business is where the leadership design, the company, uh, you know, like, um, you know, the fundamental companies are. And a lot of my clients, my audience are business leaders, and mm -hmm. they, are, they are all eager to learn new things things that they can apply to work, things that they can learn from the expert and, and people that can bring for consultancy services. So from the perspective of a leader, if you come into my organizations or my audience organizations and apply sure. design thinking to change the situation around, to bring great things that can help them to you know, survive and thrive in the, in, in the future, uh, uh, so how, how the process looks like so that, you know, we can have a vision for that? Um, sure. You know, I, I, it's hard to know where to begin. <laughs> um, but Just give us a big picture. We don't want to go into the detail because sure. the detail is a consulting business that you do. But we want to see, yeah. you know, if we want to engage to 
and you know Karen for consulting business for design thinking you know mm -hmm. what would that help us to grow our organization more sustainably how is that gonna help our organization to create competitive edge uh, you know for the future yeah yeah well, for me, well, first of all, design think, design thinking. Uh, I, I, if I would have named design thinking, I don't think I would have picked the, that choice of words. Mm. But uh, at its core, design thinking is a creative problem-solving tool. Mm. And so, no time in history, in my opinion, has there been more problems for business leaders to solve than there are today. Yes. Um, you know, whether they be outside market conditions, disruptive competitors, regulatory environments, uh, pandemics, mm. you know, the rapid change of technology, uh, you know, that leaders are bombarded left and right with problems to solve. Mm. And so much to the degree that it's very easy for them to lose sight of what their vision is for their organization. Mm. And so, whenever an organization begins to lose sight of the vision that they have for their organization or their team, depending on the leader, and they begin to focus on all the problems, those problems um, overwhelm them, they overcome them. And I think that's very much the headspace of a lot of leaders today is they're overwhelmed, uh, they're stressed, they're, you know, a number of different qualifying descriptions that, um, you know, they're so busy putting out today's fire that, you know, they they have to postpone thinking about their vision. Mm. And for me, design thinking uh, is a combination of those two. We bring them back together because, you know, uh, I, I never considered myself a philosopher, but uh, I believe it was Seneca said the obstacle is the way. And that is the truth, mm. uh, though all those problems are the way to the vision but design thinking is a way to bring those two and how do we work with them mm -hmm. how do we have the vision but then work over the obstacles so that they just dissolve upon themselves which is what i think mm -hmm. design thinking does brilliantly mm -hmm. so to me it's innovation from the inside out you know a lot of companies today they have if they can afford it they will have an innovation team mm -hmm. and they'll be all about the customers and their needs and and creating innovation and that is one way to do it and there are many organizations that are very successful at doing it Mm. The way I see innovation is more as an ecosystem mm. and that's creating innovation from the inside out. And a number of companies are starting to do this more and more today. Mm. Uh, Ford being one of them, Apple, obviously, you know, design led companies outperform the S and P by 228%. Mm. And so to me, innovation from the inside out or uh, creating an innovation ecosystem is really about maximizing the talents mm. of the individuals within the organization, giving them the opportunity to thrive and to bring their cre own creativity and experience to the problems and the vision that the company has. Mm. And then removing the all the obstacles and hindrances that keep them from reaching their full potential. And when you do that, um, you know, I believe it was Kennedy that had Quote, was quoted of saying a rising tide lifts all boats and so when you rise the tide of uh, the employees within the organization there's nothing that mm. stops the tide from rising for the organization itself thank you so much for for sharing that Karen I believe you know like like, like you shared um, there's a lot of changes you know that leaders have to you know you know bear now you know fixing the problems learning new things anticipating future problems potential problems that could come so that they can prepare from now and then i also a big fan of design thinking because somehow somewhere somewhat i feel that like people think i think less these days and we go into yeah. autopilot so we we don't think you know and then with all the you know technologies they're giving us the advancement in making decisions our ability to think even you know shrink in, in not you not know, not expand and and, yeah. and and because and then uh, so I, I I think that designing is a way to implement in that help us to you know regain you know the gift that we human beings were given you know the ability to think and and mm -hmm. also also is the is a bridge 
that have to build for future competitiveness because the younger generation get into the workforce their demands are not the same demands that you and I had they demand a lot more in terms of freedom in terms of uh, things that your yeah, environment can allow them to to thrive to to be themselves and then to be as crazy or creative you name it we name it but it has to be the environment like that and as leaders you have to equip you have to make it happen otherwise you're not going to be in the business nobody's going to work for you right so, right <laughs> so i think yeah. that you're heading on a uh, the, again it's the right direction is coming from your intuitive so uh, and uh, and and let's bring down the best of it karen all right mm -hmm. and uh, i i really enjoy our conversation today i i really admire you know all of the achievements you got uh, you have having from uh, from you know you know knowing that the the root of when you started is in the scarcity but then the abundance is in your mindset it's not you know the scarcity that bothers you so uh, I, I, I I really enjoy our conversation I hope that one day you your family are coming to my country please tell Vivi and I hey will you guys come in we will you know we will pick you up and and then uh, we with you guys around how you know and, and see in our country and uh, you know that's that would be a wonderful tour i, I i'm gonna count on that one ha huh? yeah come do it no do it um, and yeah. the travel is open already and then if we travel to the u.s you know and if we ever go into your region because we visit the u.s um, from time to time too we you know let you know and then if we can have a cup of coffee meeting you in person that would be beautiful so beautiful to us yeah uh, I, i'm on the other opposite side of uh, the u.s of seattle but if you're ever in florida or if i'm ever out west and we happen to be out there at the same time that would be great that would be wonderful we will look forward to it we will also visit uh, america city by city not just seattle so we will go there yeah <laughs> well wait, next time you're in the country let me know what cities you're going to be in if i'm anywhere close i will come and visit Wonderful, wonderful. Karen, you have a wonderful day there. We thank you for spending your time with us, the audience, and we thank you for uh, for sharing your your story and knowing that being in a, 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 a introvert person, sharing personal stories sometimes is challenging, but then you're yeah. overcoming that and sharing a lot with us, so we really appreciate that. We wish you and your family all the best, and the world is small. We will meet one day, all right? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ha. Huh? Thank you. You have a great day. You have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.